Okay, um, so good morning to all of you. Happy afternoon to me. I'm over in Virginia, so it's, you know, lunchtime for me, breakfast for you. And I'm hoping that this will be a really nice way to start your Friday morning where you can kind of have a little bit of fun, but also a little bit of learning and kind of ease into your day and hopefully end your week uh, on a high note. So I know that a few of you might have seen me present before, or maybe most of you. So I've been involved with the CQI community a little bit. So I'm familiar with your work, but I'm not an expert. Um, back in 2017, I gave a keynote at the Illinois kind of version at their conference conference and then in 2018 came to the California conference I think it's either in February or March I can't remember um, and I think I gave two sessions so you might have seen me like in one kind of block or another and then today in 2019 giving a webinar with all of you and a lot has happened since then so if you saw me you know almost a year ago at your conference in person I have rebranded for my business so professionally been working on um, like a new LLC name now I'm depict data studio to reflect um, a lot of the team-based projects that I've been working on so I hire subcontractors quite regularly either somebody with like a certain data analysis skill set or graphic design skill set or just a certain um, like computer software program that I don't use that a client needs so it's nice to be able to kind of I'm, I'm super extroverted too so it's really nice to be able to work in teams again and let's see got a new website and everything and then personally I had another baby so I think would I have been pregnant when I saw you all yeah but I probably wasn't showing or it was probably er too early to say something so I had like baby number two since we've seen each other and you would think that I would be smart and kind of do all of the professional work and rebranding like at one time and then do all the personal stuff like have a baby at the second time but being like the crazy person that I am I didn't plan that very well and I kind of did it all at the same time and um, my new website actually launched like while I was in the hospital like an hour before my baby was born and I remember they um, the website company was like texting me like we've got the website up go test it out it's live thousands of people are looking at it right now and I was like BRB gotta have a baby see you later like see you in three months when I can think about this um, so yeah it's been a fun year um, okay so let's test out this chat and see how it's going kind of give you your first opportunity to interact I'm wondering how many of you saw me speak in California before and if so what is your biggest um, like takeaway that you remember from that like um, not just yeah. like oh yeah I think you look familiar but if you remember something from that experience yeah. And being a visual person, I'll do much better seeing what you chat, you know, type in the chat box than like hearing 40 people at once talk on audio. So test out the chat window. Let me know. Did you see me speak in California before? And if so, do you remember anything? Hopefully a few things from the experience. Okay. Anybody? Or are you all brand new people? I think you would have seen me before. Okay, so Morgan is brand new. Nice to officially meet you, Morgan. You're in for a treat learning about data viz. Okay, one brave person. That's it. Okay, no big deal. Um, <laughs> Melanie says, hi. New to meeting me as well. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Phil. Phil's brand new. Nicholas missed the presentation. I guess maybe you were there. Um, Casey's new. Okay, so, so far mostly new people. Okay, good. So the way that I crafted this webinar was I tried to think about what are the key principles that I really, really want to cover in just 90 minutes, but I wanted to make sure that those of you had seen me speak before, it wasn't any of the same slides. So I tried to pick out like new like same principles, but new illustrations of those principles. And I tried to pull in examples that um, hopefully will be fairly relevant to your work. I've worked with a lot of child welfare groups, um, both you know in past full-time salaried positions that I've had and in consulting positions. So um, hopefully you'll leave with some really practical skills. Okay. Lots and lots of new people. Great. Okay, so let's get started. Um, if you've never learned about DataViz before, here is um, something good for you to know. It's super, super easy. So it basically goes like this. This is 
your, your shortcut to telling a story with data. You simply declutter your visual and then you add a dark light contrast and then you write some crystal clear text just stating your story or your takeaway message directly in the graph's title. So your before and after makeover will look, you know, something like this that you see on screen. Now this is a fictional example. I just made up kind of some generic like organization A, organization B, and some just made up percentages. Um, but I've worked with a lot of nonprofits and especially grant makers like foundations and government agencies. So I work with a lot of groups like this that need to track, you know, something over time and maybe want to drill down and see like, is a certain program offering making a difference? Or let's just look at this grantee organization, or let's look at just this site where we're running some programming and, you know, just kind of focus on one story at a time. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail so I can show you just like how simple this is. So you start with your default graph about, you know, again, this is just generic data. You'd start with your real data. And this is what your software program gives you. So everything that I'm showing you today is just in good old Excel and PowerPoint. You don't have to purchase any fancy software. This is, you know, generally what your default graph is going to look like. And there are a lot of issues here. So um, someday in all my spare time, I'm going to go work at Microsoft and fix all of the defaults. But until then, you have to roll up your sleeves and make some intentional edits. So some of the problems with the default graphs are, let's just go left to right. So start and look at that axis on the left where it goes 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. It's just so busy. It's almost uh, just too much detail for your audience to really be able to look at anything. And then middle of the graph is a total mess because you have all of those grid lines going horizontally across. It's really, really busy. And there are all those colored lines, like all zigzagging and crisscrossing in all different colors. We call this a spaghetti graph because it's all intertwining and interwoven and it's just like really hard to tell one line apart from the other. And then if you look at the right side of the graph, the legend or key is a total mess. Those are outdated. We don't use separate legends and keys anymore. There are a few, um, you know, a few exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, we don't use those because they're not accessible. If you were talking with somebody who is colorblind, who has a color vision deficiency, it's going to be really hard for them to trace their colors back and forth from the legend to the graph, the legend to the graph. If you print it out in grayscale, people still do tons of printing and color ink's expensive. You can't print everything in full color. It's going to be not just hard, it would be impossible with these colors to tell all the grays back and forth zigzagging your eyes. And then for everybody else, it's just a huge time suck to say, okay, this purple thing is organization A, let me go find the purple line, and you're like competing for attention with all the other lines. So no more separate legends. I'll show you what we do instead. Okay, so you start with your default graph, and then you declutter. So I've changed a lot here. Um, you'll notice that I removed the color. I usually do that in my editing process. I'll just turn everything to gray and just kind of push it all to the background so that later, the next step, I can say, okay, what really matters? What should I draw people's attention to? What one thing at a time really, really matters? I've also removed that separate legend or separate key altogether, and I've used a technique called direct labeling. Direct labeling just means you place the labels directly beside the data. So in a line graph like this, you would just place the labels off to the right side of the graph. Really, really easy. I have blog posts on how to do this. It's really, really simple to do right inside of Excel or PowerPoint or Word, wherever you're creating your graphics. And then instead of having that axis on the left where it goes 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, total overkill, I decided to add the exact percentages just right beside their lines so people had the detail that they were looking for. Okay, so this is the decluttered version. And then next, I think about what one thing at a time do I want to draw people's attention to. There are a lot of correct options here. I went with fictional organization B that had the most improvement. They had the steepest line going up. Everybody loves a good success story. You can look at this and say, wow, I wonder what organization B was doing that was so cool. Let's learn their secret and do it too. You might focus on something that's going down over time if you want to um, you know, kind of steer your ship and get back on track and make some improvements and draw people's attention to like, whoa, we need to focus on this thing that's not improving. You might focus on a line that's flat and that could be your story. It's up to you to use your best professional judgment to figure out what your audience needs and what's the most important thing for you to focus on them.
uh, focus on for them. Now, some people think that they're afraid that using color like this is somehow like, I don't know, like biasing your data or not telling the whole story. But I feel like it's the opposite. I feel like it's a great way to respect your viewer's time. It's not dumbing down the graph at all. It's just saying, hey, I understand you're a really busy person. You've got a lot of data that you see every day that comes across your inbox. Just look at this dark line first. Their eyes can't help but look at just the dark line. The other lines are all still there, but they're pushed to the background. They're in gray. So you look at the dark thing first, and then they have plenty of contextual data that they can look at a split second later. Okay, so declutter, add a dark light contrast like this, and then the final thing you do is you write some crystal clear text. You state the story directly in the title, the headline, or the lead of your graph. So rather than just, you know, figure two, organizational results or some silly generic headline that maybe you used to do in your grad school papers. Uh, you just make it really easy for people. You state your story in the title. So the title here, you know, it's obviously going to match your graph. You're going to want to have some really nice consistency there. Organization B improved the most. If this was a written document, like a report or a handout, you can add a little subtitle. Over the course of the seven-year project, organization B increased from 11% to 74%, et cetera, et cetera. And I've even purposefully highlighted organization B again in that action color. You wouldn't use these colors. You'd use your own organization's branding so that it matches and you look really professional. Okay, so really, really simple. You just kind of declutter. You clean up the software's messy default settings. You apply a dark light contrast, and then you write a title and subtitle. Here's another one, and I'm gonna do this makeover side by side, left and right, so you can see both of them. I've got some nice music in the background. <laughs> Let me try to mute some people. Let's see. Chris, I don't think I can mute anybody, but maybe you can. Okay, great, perfect. Okay, so here's another example, and I'll do this makeover side by side so you can really see how it comes together. This is, again, just fictional data. I'm pretending that you surveyed some students and you said, hey, students, what's your favorite ice cream color, uh, ice cream flavor? Chocolate, cookie dough, mint, vanilla, or strawberry? So you've got the default graph that your Excel or PowerPoint is going to give you that would look something like this. Lots and lots of clutter. There's a border around the outside. There's the axis, 0, 50, 100. And you have the labels specifically on each bar, like 90 votes or 48 votes. And there are grid lines going down, just lots of unnecessary ink. So at the bare, bare minimum, we're going to declutter that graph. So here's what the decluttered version would look like. Nice and clean. Whether you wanna tell a story or not, you absolutely have to declutter every single graph. That's the low hanging fruit edit. It's what I do first. You're just clicking on your screen and hitting delete, 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 or you might do some right clicks in Excel or PowerPoint to find the, the ink that you're looking for to delete those things. Okay, then you apply a dark light contrast. So you pick out just one thing from your graph that you're gonna highlight at a time. You're not dumbing it down. You're not deleting the cookie dough and mint and vanilla and strawberry. You're just respecting that your viewers are really busy people and you're saying, hey, look at this dark thing first about chocolate and then a split second later, they can look at the rest of them. And then finally, you write some clear text into your title. Chocolate was the most popular ice cream flavor. That's it. Really, really, really easy. Um, it's so funny. I teach usually, you know, full day workshops or two day workshops, or I also have an, an online course that's 28 hours of learning and all the how to's. But this is really all it comes down to just decluttering dark light contrast and clear text. Okay, so let's practice these uh, even more and go into some more nuances. So this is what we're, we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the <laughs> information overload or the 100-page dusty shelf reports that people are used to receiving, where you just feel inundated with so much data and so much information. So you have to kind of wade through all of this, do the hard work for your audience, and think about what makes an interesting story for your audience. So when I mentioned a minute ago that it's really up to you to use your best professional judgment on what you're going to highlight highlight in each graph. These are the things that after, you know, doing this for 10 or 15 years that I tend to highlight. 
over and over, the things that I found have been most interesting for my audience. So sometimes you might highlight in your graph something that's going well, like fictional organization B, that success story. Or on the flip side, what's not going well? What's the thing that's going down over time that you need to say, whoa, time out team. Like we really need to pay attention to this and get this back on track. That could be the thing you highlight with your dark light contrast. Number two, this also makes an interesting story. Did we reach our goals? Why or why not? This is especially helpful for groups that have some type of strategic plan goals or an outcome goals. Like you want 70% of people to hit you know, whatever X, Y, Z thing that you're tracking. So that, of course, is going to be really, really interesting for your audience. Uh, number three, what increased over time? What decreased? What stayed the same? Whenever you can pull in more and more historical data, that's going to strengthen your graph. So not just showing like, here's how we're doing in right now in 2019, but showing 2018 as a comparison point or 2017, or maybe you break it down by quarter or month or even week, depending on what you're measuring. That's going to really add some rich context and show that you're, you know, this like unbiased number cruncher who's there to help and there to provide a truthful story. Number four, this is where you get to um, just really pull into like the human side of data and trust your gut instinct. What's surprising to you personally as you look at your spreadsheet? Is there something that stood out? Is there something where you're like, this number is way higher than I personally would have thought. This number is double than what it, you know, what I would have expected to see, or it's half of what I would have expected to see. What stands out to you? Um, and that's going to be different for everybody, but that's going to make a really, really interesting story for other people to look at. And the flip side of that, of course, what unfolded exactly as expected? That can be a nice introduction, like this thing is always 60% year after year, you know, and then you move on to like, but the really surprising thing was that this thing was half of what we expected it to be. Um, and number five, for what makes an interesting story, what to look for in your data set, who else needs to see this? That's what makes your data really actionable. So as you're looking through your spreadsheets, think like, what does my leader at my organization need to see? Or what does my peer at another organization need to see? Who else needs to know about this data so they can take action? How can I get my data into their hands? And, and whose hands does it need to be in? So you're not just losing all your really valuable information and just kind of having it gather dust in your files and in your spreadsheet. Okay, so now um, I'd actually like to hear from you. Let me go back to this slide. Let's think for a minute, type in the chat window, and let me know examples of audiences you work with that like the traditional approach on the left. And then tell me examples of audiences you work with that prefer the storytelling version on the right. Because some audiences, like I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll give you part of the, the answer here. Like, journal articles. If you're maybe a professor writing peer-reviewed articles for a living, that's going to be the one on the left. Super traditional. You're not really giving away the story. It's up to the reader to read between the lines and figure out the so what and interpret the data for themselves, where other audiences are going to prefer the one on the right. So, so um, type in the chat. Give me some examples. Who prefers the one on the left? Who prefers the one on the right? Which audience wants which one from you? because it's your job to think about how you go back and forth. Mary says, management likes the one on the left. Our social workers like the one on the right. Yep. Yeah, usually people like social workers who are closer to the ground, closer to the work being done, they have so much on their plates. I mean, social workers, especially, that's got to be one of the careers like social workers, teachers, nurses, the people who are like really in the thick of the work, they've got so much going on that anything you can do to kind of cut to the chase and save them some time, they're going to be so appreciative of you doing that for them. Anybody else? Who prefers the one on the left and who prefers the one on the right? Well, I'll tell you some more examples then. Um, so people who prefer the one on the left, it might be the really, really technical audiences, like the fellow peers reading your peer-reviewed journal article, 
or people who are in the know, people who are really familiar with that data set and really invested in it personally, like it just really interests them. And they're gonna take the time to read between the lines and think about, okay, what does this really mean? And they might have the time to spend a minute or, or five minutes kind of thinking about the implications of that data. People on the right, it's gonna be more the practitioners, people who, um, their specialty is something other than your topic area. You know, this isn't what they do 40 hours a week, so they're relying on you as the expert. Maybe not the expert who's like written the book on the topic or given the TED talk on that topic, but the expert in the sense that that's what you work on. That is your specialty 40 hours or more a week. Ray says the one on the right's more modern. Yeah, um, not just modern looking, like it's certainly cleaner, just from an aesthetic sense, like a graphic design sense, but also um, there's just such a big trend in the last, you know, five or 10 years, we have more data than ever before. So people are trying to figure out what do we do with all this data? It's not like you're running your first survey or you're doing like your very first focus group you've ever done or you're getting your database for your organization for the very first time. That was, you know, a decade plus ago that people were starting to collect data in social service type settings. And now what a lot of groups um, are struggling with in my experience and having been the person like working in the nonprofit too, have you know, experiencing this every day is we just have so much data. We're trying to think like, what really does our board need to see or what does our um, executive director need to see? What do our mental health counselors need to see? What do the after school staff running those programs need to see? And like, how can I get it to them quickly so they can improve what they're doing and then move on, you know, like focus on something else and not be just like bogged down in, in so many details. Cool. Okay, so let's go through um, some more nuances of data viz techniques. So after I've thought about my audience and whether they're expecting a traditional approach from me or a storytelling approach, then the next step is typically to choose the right chart for, you know, that story that I'm trying to tell. So Chris is going to make available to you a two-page chart chooser. Um, so you'll, maybe you've gotten this already in email or if not, you know, Chris will get it too. This is my cheat sheet of my favorite chart types. It's not every chart known to humankind. There are many more charts than this available to you, but these are the ones that I use on a regular basis and I think should be on your radar. So you can print it out, you know, tape it above your desk if you'd like or print it you know, front and back, use it as a reference guide, pass it out to people in your audience, you know, share this with them um, so this can make their life a little bit easier too. I've broken this down into families of charts. So you can see exploratory charts that help me explore my data set and see what a story might be. Part to whole charts like pies and donuts. Charts that are good for comparisons like bar charts, like you're comparing this bar to this bar to this bar maps, distribution, before and after charts, patterns over time, and so on. So you can kind of think about what category you've got, like before and after would be like this grant cycle compared to like the other grant cycle, or fall education scores compared to spring education scores, or how you were doing in January compared to December, you know, and then you can kind of zoom in and say, oh, these are the few options that I have to work with. So hopefully it doesn't feel overwhelming, like, whoa, I've got all this data and there are all these charts, where do I start? But you can really narrow it down uh, a little bit further. So let's look at a couple of these. Okay, uh, people love to hate on pie charts and I can see why. I know that you haven't encountered pie charts this poorly. Um, I googled like awful pie charts, you know, the worst pie charts, and this was one of my favorite ones that I found. One of my friends says that her life's mission is ridding the world of 3D exploding pie charts like this, and I don't lose sleep over pie charts. I lose sleep over the 100-page dusty shelf reports that I know nobody's going to read despite hours and hours of very smart people's time being poured into them. But of course, you know, you can see what she means when she says that's her life's mission is to get rid of things like this. So it's not that you can never use pie charts, but you can only use them in really slim circumstances. So think of pies and then donuts. That's just a pie chart with a hole punched in the middle. Same thing. These are really only for two slice comparisons. So something like women and men or kids who graduated high school on time versus people who didn't, or people who speak Mandarin versus people who don't. 
really simple, you know, two slice pies. That's about the max that our brain can read. Three, maybe kind of borderline, but really two is the sweet spot for these. So what do you do in all the other situations? I have a blog post you might like. Um, Chris, I'll send you the, the link maybe so you can forward it to people. It's about all the alternatives to pie charts. So if you have, you know, like this type of data set, try this instead of a pie chart. Or if you have this type of variable, try this instead of a pie chart. So you've got pies, you know, simple two slice pies, and you've seen donuts, the pie with the hole in the middle. Have you seen square pies? Square pies can be a nice alternative, or better yet, waffle charts. There's some research showing that waffle charts are even easier for our brains than pie charts or donut charts. Some students just wrote their dissertation on this, so they're probably going to publish the data and make it, you know, official, official knowledge uh, sometime soon. They had people come into their lab at the university, and they gave them everything in this part to whole family, so pies, donuts, stacked bar charts, square pies, waffles, but they didn't tell them what percentage was represented. So they didn't say, hey, that green waffle chart has 10%, like they covered that up. And they gave the participants a few seconds to glance at each different chart type, and then they quizzed them. They said, what percentage do you think is represented? And waffles came out as the clear winner. I think it's a combination of squares being easier for our brains than circles. We can't use thing, do things like uh, radius and circumference and area of a circle. Those are really hard things for our brains to do on the fly, but we can quickly tally up like how many little squares are there or estimate it like, oh, that's about 10. We can do that much easier with a square waffle chart than a sliver of a pie chart. So anytime you're thinking about doing a two slice pie, you might try a two slice waffle as an alternative. These are really easy to make right inside of Excel or PowerPoint. Again, I have a blog post on how to do this. So if you just kind of think like, oh, I might try that, then you just go Google how to make a waffle chart or go to my website and check it out. And then, you know, you've got the tutorial for yourself. An alternative to waffles is called an icon array. You don't have to use the little squares. Sometimes that can look a little bit too scientific for certain audiences. So you can replace the squares with miniature clip art, simple icons like this. This is just a made up example, something about, I don't know, maybe the percentage of people who drink coffee every morning out of these different groups. Uh, the percentages would be real, a lot higher, probably closer to like 80% or something. Um, but there are all sorts of easy to use icons. Icons um, too, they're almost foolproof to find these days. They're right inside of Excel and PowerPoint, the latest versions at least. You just go up to the insert tab and you'll see a little icon. Um, it's hard to miss. It has a picture of a duck on it, a duck and a leaf, and it says icons. So you click on that and you pull up the library of free icons that you have available. Or you can go to the nounproject.com, noun like N-O-U-N, you know, a person, place, or thing. Those are the concepts best represented by icons as your, your people, your places, and your things. The nounproject.com, they have lots of free icons, probably in the thousands of free icons, so well beyond the free library that Microsoft gives you. And then um, I just purchased this myself. I purchased an annual um, subscription. It's just $39.99 a year, so you can download tens of thousands of icons and use them throughout your projects. I really like icons because there's also some research showing that graphs with icons are more memorable than graphs without icons. So another research group had people come into their lab and they gave them, you know, um, one group got, like the treatment group got the ones with icons, the control group got the ones without icons, and they gave people time to read these graphs, you know, depending on which group they were randomly assigned to with a little coin flip. And then they had people come back to their lab two days later. So not like two years later, just two days. So let's say you came into their lab on a Monday and then you go back on a Wednesday and the researchers said, hey, you were here just two days ago. What do you remember doing in our lab? And the people who saw the version without icons, they were like, I don't know, I looked at some papers, I think there is some data in there. And the people who saw the version with icons were like, oh yeah, I looked at graphs and this is what the graph was about. I remember this topic area. The people who didn't see the icons didn't even remember seeing data two 
days ago. How are people supposed to act on your data if they don't even remember seeing it? So whenever you can add icons, you know, they don't fit for every single project, but whenever you can, consider them the icing on the cake, like bonus points, and use them as much as possible. I'll show you a lot of examples today that are using icons. I've made a very intentional um, push for myself to use them whenever I can. Okay, let's look at a couple new chart types to you. Not the bar chart, you've seen bar charts all the time before, but here's an alternative. It's called the dot plot. It's also called a lollipop chart because it looks like a lollipop. It looks like, you know, the stick with like the hard candy, circle candy at the end. There's also research showing that these are even more accurate to read than bar charts. This research goes back 30 years since the 80s, William Cleveland and all of his team members along the way. Again, same study, you know, you have people come into the lab, you give them a variety of chart types like bar charts or dot plots or this or that, and you see what is most accurate. And there's something about dot plots compared to, let's go back to bars. In bar charts, you're comparing the length of the bar, like this length compared to like this little length compared to this other length. Pretty good for our brains, but we're even better at reading dots along a line. It's like a slight kind of increase in accuracy. So let me show you where this comes from so you can see how basic of a chart this is. You just go back to the regular bar chart and think about where your eyes go when you look at this. You're looking at the ends of the bars. Your brain is designed to be drawn to the end of the bar, to that kind of jagged line going down, and you're comparing the lengths of these rectangles. So a dot plot knows that you're doing that, and it puts a dot or a circle on the end point. And then you just kind of peel away the bar, and what you're left with is this super clean, super streamlined, super accurate dot plot. You can use dot plots as an alternative to bar charts, you know, just to compare a bunch of different variables or whatever it is that you're looking at. You can also use two sets of them along the same line, like you could compare subgroups or two points in time, whatever types of comparisons you've got. The first time I made one of these, I did it for a study where we had surveyed principals of schools and teachers in the school, and we wanted to compare how their viewpoints were similar or different. So you could look at, you know, just the teachers in one color dot or just the principals in another color dot, or the really interesting part, the distance in between the dots to see like, okay, these dots are practically on top of each other, their viewpoints really aligned here, or these dots are really far apart. Wow, what a divergence in opinion. Um, and a dot plot was a great, clean, accurate way to get those findings across. Here's another dot plot. Um, it's a real life dot plot from the Washington Post comparing uh, the horrible, horrible cost of living in the DC area where I live. Um, not that California is any better. I know it's really expensive over there too. Um, but I wanted to show you how you can have tons and tons of dots along a line. You're not just limited to two dots. This is a great way to show variability in your data set or show the distribution in your data set. So each of these little gray dots is um, a metro area around the U.S., like a housing market area. And then this is online, so you could select from the drop-down menu, like where you lived or how big your household was, and et cetera, and you see like your dot, your focus area in that dark light contrast in the turquoise. This isn't as much dark light contrast as I would like. I wish that that turquoise was a little bit darker. I wish the gray was a little bit lighter. You know, it's not perfect, but you can kind of, it helps you kind of zoom in on like one dot compared to all the comparison points, all the dots along a line. I don't know where these text boxes went. Well, there were text boxes there. Um, I guess I deleted them as I was going through. I was going to show you how this is classroom ratings um, with a, like a structured kind of survey observational tool comparing two different points in time to how students did. And I was going to show you how you could use arrows to show like everything went up in this dot plot. Um, or here's another one looking at pre and post test results using arrows to show these things went up and these things went down, all different variations of dot plots. Okay, so thinking back to bar charts again, this is kind of um, an advanced maneuver where you can spruce up your bar charts. If you have to present any type of progress towards a goal, you might fall in either of these buckets. So sometimes the, the things that you're tracking, like a, B, C, and D. Maybe they have the same goal or target, like 80%. In that case, you would just put a target line right on top of your bars or columns to show whether things were, you know, meeting the goal or not. Um, or sometimes you kind of have 
an apples to oranges comparison where A, B, C, and D all have different goals or different targets. And in that case, you use a graph type called overlapping bars or overlapping columns to do that, you know, simple comparison, like a, what would it be called? Like an intra comparison where you put each group's target or goal and then the result with a dark light contrast. So kind of tuck these examples away, just in case you have a setting like this, um, where, you know, a scenario like this, and then I'll share the slides with you, of course, and now you kind of have some more ideas of how you could present it to spruce up your bar charts and add more context. Here's another style of bar chart that you might use, a histogram. A histogram is just a fancy word for when the columns are grouped into bins, B-I-N-S. It just means, you know, you've got like the zero to nine year olds and the 10 to 19 year olds. So you've seen these a million times. You might use them on a regular basis. Have you seen population pyramids? Population pyramids are a spin on this where you break it out a little bit further. So you've got something like age ranges kind of in the center. It's like a, uh, like a histogram kind of, you know, tilted on its side. And you can compare two groups. Like you could compare males and females. You could compare Mandarin speakers to those that don't speak Mandarin. Or people who, you know, were born in California and weren't born in California. Any types of groups that you want to compare. And you can see, are, do they have like a mirror image of each other? Are these things symmetrical or not? How does the distribution vary? You can make a small multiples layout out of anything. Small multiples means multiple small charts, like multiple little population pyramids. I'm trying to show you ways that you can take the basics about graphing that you already know and just take it, you know, a little step further and apply it in new ways. So if you understand the concept of a histogram, then you can try a population pyramid. And once you understand the concept of, of a population pyramid, you could try a small multiples population pyramid. This one comes from Pew Research Center. They're just looking at Japan's um, age and sex breakdown over time. So you've got the 1970 population pyramid, 2010, 2050. These are not the same. It's not like the same little graph over and over. They're showing how Japan has shifted. People are getting older in Japan. The article that accompanied this was fascinating. They were talking about how even though Japan doesn't have a formal one-child policy, culturally, that's what people tend to do. And if you only have one child, like how does that affect everything going forward um, in the next few decades and what are they going to do with like Japan's version of retirement and pension planning and social security. Super, super interesting, but I digress. I get too interested in the data sometimes. Um, again, just wanted to show you that you could do a, a small multiples layout to add even more nuance. Okay, let's look at one more graph type and then we'll move on to some best practices and some before and after makeovers. So if you've got a lot of data over time, like year by year or quarter by quarter or month by month, then you're going to put that in a line chart, right? You've done that. You've made a million of these. Um, this one is semi-fictional, semi-real. I changed the words around. I changed the numbers, but the, the project basically went like this. I was working with the foundation in Southern California that um, they wanted to compare how many grants they'd given out over time in different areas. So they had grants related to the arts or grants that they gave out related to children or grants related to this or grants related to this. Simple things like how many grants, how many projects they funded. And if you just have one single line on your graph, like how many arts grants you gave out, you're good. Like thumbs up, good to go, super easy to read graph. But you've seen this before. What happens in real life? You run into the spaghetti line graph. You've got a lot of things that you want to look at all at once. And no matter which colors you choose, if your lines intersect and overlap, it just looks like a pile of messy spaghetti just kind of tossed on your plate. It's a complete mess. So you, you can't do anything of this graph. It's unreadable. Like the smartest person in the world, you cannot expect them to read this graph. It's a throwaway graph. You have to fix it, okay? This isn't even going to go in your draft report. This is not going to go to your staff meeting, to your fellow coworkers. Like this, when you run into this scenario, it does not leave your computer. You have to say, okay, time out. I've got to fix it. So I'm going to show you a few alternatives to this spaghetti line chart and surprise, surprise, it comes back to dark light contrast again. If you take nothing away from this webinar or just one thing, you know, I hope that it's the dark light con contrast uh, 
technique because it's so powerful and so easy. Okay, so here's what you can do. You could try, again, dark light contrast. Highlight just one line at a time. Let's say that you knew that your foundation board members were interested in grants related to religion or one of the other lines. You know, again, you use your best professional judgment to think about what story is going to be most interesting to them. And you highlight that one in a dark color and the other things get grayed out. Sure, you can't tell the grays apart from one another, you know, because they all intersect. Like, you can't really tell which line is arts or which one's children. It gets tricky, but that's okay. That's not the star of the show. That's all, like, the supporting character, and what you really want people to focus on is just that one dark line at a time. Here's another alternative. You could try a small multiples graph. You have multiple small graphs arranged on the screen or arranged on the handout, whatever dissemination format you're making. Rather than having all the six lines all intersect like the pile of spaghetti, you just break them out and look at one of them at a time. The thing that I really like about small multiples graphs is you can add some labels to them. So you might label you know, maybe a high point or a low point on the line or the most recent data point. Like in this case, we just had 2016 data available. So you could label just that latest point. And then you've got, again, all that great contextual data from past years, kind of the gist of it still there. Sometimes these lines can look really lonely, just having one line at a time. So here's another option for you. You can shade in the area underneath it so that they uh, pop out a little bit more. So look at kind of like before that line is competing for attention with all the gray grid lines versus after. It's more of like a solid shape that your eyes can see right away. I usually use some transparent colors, and that's just a right click and changing the transparency of your colors um, so that you can still see the grid lines in the background and you can estimate what those numbers are. Or here's a combination of a, a small multiples and a dark light contrast. You still make small multiples and then you highlight just one line at a time. So in the arts example in the upper left corner, you're showing all six lines, but you're just highlighting just the arts line. And then in the children graph, you're just highlighting the children line. And then in the education graph, you're just highlighting the education time. This is tons and tons of contrast. It helps you see kind of like which line is highest or lowest in relation to the others. Sometimes this version can be overwhelming for some viewers who just like, let me just, you know, get the gist of the data and move on. So you're going to have to gauge your audience. Nobody's going to know your audience better than you. Okay, let me know in the chat window, do you have a preference to avoid the spaghetti line graph? Which one appeals to you the most? Do you like the highlighting approach? Do you like the small multiples? Do you like the small multiples with the shading underneath? That's the small multiples area. Or the combo, the small multiples with highlighting. Do any of these really grab your attention where you're like, oh, that's promising. I could try that in my real work. What are your favorites? Carry like small multiples, small multiples area, small multiples. Yeah, I think that's my favorite too, the small multiples area. I wanted to put them all on the same screen for you so you could, you know, compare them really easily. Um, definitely like that approach. Great. So again, you'll have these slides afterwards. So if you want to try this um, in the future, you know, go for it. You've got this kind of like solution or, or answer that you can refer back to. Let's try uh, a makeover real quick. We'll see if you've got any ideas for, for this one. This is actually based on a CQI project that a conference attendee showed to me. Um, I think it was at the Illinois conference, or maybe at California, I think at Illinois. And she said, hey, you know, I work for this school district and we wanna compare this one school. I've just like masked it. We're just calling it the ABC school. And I want to compare this school to the district. And I'm, I just want to look at how many students qualify for free or reduced meals in the school to the district. So this was her before graph. And I looked at this and I was like, this almost works, but it doesn't quite work. And we'll see if you can figure out why it doesn't work. And it's because, remember how I said pies and donuts? They really work best with two slices. Three is kind of like eh, borderline. So here we've got three slices. So it's kind of like right on the cusp of if it's too much for our brains or not. And then I thought, okay, it's not just that. It's not just that it's three slices. There's something beyond this where it doesn't work. And it's because, do you see how, and these are the real numbers too. 
the 5% for how many students qualified for reduced price lunches, they're both 5%, like they should be equal. But do you see how the outer circle, the outer concentric circle, it looks bigger than the inner circle. The, the way that the rings are kind of inside each other are distorting the data. So it's not accurate. It's actually like making the numbers seem larger or smaller than they really are. So that's like out, no inaccuracies. We can't do that. That's like totally off limits um, in data viz. So we had to fix this. So here's what we came up with. Um, there are three makeovers and then you can vote on which one you like the best. I have a favorite in mind though. Here's what we tried. And in my former kind of research and program evaluation life, I'm a huge data nerd. Um, and I say that lovingly, like, yeah, data, cool. Like, let's be nerds together. Um, so this is what I came up with first, the stacked column chart. There's nothing wrong with these column charts. They're just overused. So a lot of times in my editing process, I have to look back at my entire report or my entire slideshow or my infographic as a whole and say, oh, have I done it again where I just have bar chart after bar chart after bar chart after bar chart, which again are accurate charts, plenty easy to read. There's nothing wrong with them. You just don't want to have the same chart and the same chart and the same chart. So I think about like, what am I really trying to get across with these charts? And can I swap some of them out for something else? Is there some alternative? So, you know, this works, but it's not the, the most fun chart. And you'll see in all three of these makeovers, um, I did do a few things consistently across all of them. So I picked one color for the district and one color for the school um, so that people could like really keep track of them really easily. And a lot of times I'll do this throughout an entire report or throughout an entire presentation. I'll pick, you know, I'll think about the two or three categories that I'm comparing like district and school and district and school kind of slide after slide. And I'll use those colors consistently the whole time. Now again, you're not gonna use my colors, you're gonna use your colors, so yours will look a little bit different, but just think of the concept of like, this category is always in this color, this category is already in, always in this color, you can definitely do that. Okay, so stacked columns work, just not too interesting. Here's another example that we came up with, and it's waffle charts, two waffle charts side by side. These almost work, but not quite. And I think again, it's because, remember pies and donuts and waffles, everything in that part to whole family, it's really gonna work best with two slices or two subcategories. This one has three, the free meals, the reduced meals, and then like everybody else in gray that I didn't label on purpose because like that's not the star of the show. I don't want people to get lost in the weeds. So I feel like I tried putting the labels in different places. Like let's look at that, the district one, the blue one on the left. I tried putting a text box for like free meals, 27% right on top of the dark blue segment, but it just looked really busy. And I was like dragging these text boxes all over my screen. It just wasn't working. And I feel like it's a lot of eye zigzags back and forth. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's still legible, but it just wasn't as clear as what I was going for. I wanted something like really, really quick just to do a simple school district comparison. So here's the next version we came up with. We went even bigger picture so people wouldn't get stuck in the weeds. And we tried an icon array. We replaced those little squares in the waffle chart with some shapes. We used apples because in the US, you know, apples and education kind of go hand in hand. You'll see that symbolism or that imagery over and over. And this had to do with meals and, you know, feeding students at school. So apples worked. These are just the apples right inside of Microsoft's free icon library. So they were really easy to find. Um, and then big picture wise too, we had to do some rounding here. So you have to be comfortable with rounding and whole numbers to use icon arrays. Let me go back real quick. And you can see how for the district, it was like 27% of kids with free meals and 5% with reduced price, which adds up to 32% total. We didn't just color in like a sliver of an apple to show a you know, 32%. We just went big picture and we didn't talk about percentages either. We talked about how many students out of 10. I try to use whole numbers whenever possible because they're a lower numeracy level than percentages. I deal with data all day long. So like percentages and percentiles and percentage point changes and all those types of terms, like no big deal. Like that's what I do. But for a lot of people who just deal with data once in a while, even percentages are just like more than what they normally encounter, but whole numbers are nice and simple. So I'll try to say like, you know, 32 out of 100 students or three in 10 students, a great way to show some at-a-glance findings. 
this is the makeover that I liked the best because it got straight to the point of what the woman liked. Um, if you like the stacked columns, if you prefer the waffles, let me know. You know, these are all correct makeovers. And again, it depends on your audience and what their comfort level is, you know, what their background level is, what their familiarity with the data set is too. Okay, let's go into some more best practices and then I'm gonna give you an opportunity in our last half an hour to try this yourself. So after I've thought about my audience and after I've chosen the right chart type, like a pie chart or a bar chart or a line chart or something else all together off your chart chooser, then the next step I do is I declutter my chart. Every single chart gets decluttered. It doesn't matter what software program you're using. You could use like the fanciest, most expensive software program ever. You still have to make some intentional edits and just say delete, 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 delete. So decluttering in a nutshell goes like this. It just means removing unnecessary ink. And what you remove, you know, kind of depends. Like how do you know you're done decluttering? You know you're done decluttering when your graph passes the squint test. And that means you can squint your eyes. I'm gonna look really silly, like don't look at my face, but you kind of squint your eyes, you're peering at the graph in between your eyelashes, and you should be able to see the data. You should be able to see the pattern of the data. Like in this little scatter plot, are the dots kind of all going like this direction or are they all going down? Like what's the general shape of the data? Is the line going up or down or is it flat or is there a peak in the middle? You should be able to see that trend. You shouldn't be distracted by unnecessary lines like borders and grid lines and tick marks and definitely not background shading. That's really outdated and doesn't support how our brains read graphs at all. So try the squint test on your own reports. You know, just open up your draft report or the report, you know, you wrote a year ago and just squint at it and say, what stands out? Like, does the message that I'm trying to get across, can I even see it at a glance? Is it, is there enough dark light contrast? Is there enough size conference uh, contrast? Like, we know that big text is going to stand out more than little text. Um, the simple edits like that. Let's talk about borders for a second and I'll show you why I'm not a fan of borders. So this was um, a spread of a report, just the demographic section, kind of background section of a report I worked on a few years ago. Super simple background demographics and there are almost no borders on this spread. The exception is there's a, a table in the upper right, but it has gray borders, gray lines, not black lines. So, you know, it's okay, light gray is okay. If I would have kept the borders, it would have gotten a little bit busy. It would have looked like this. And if I would have kept the borders around the text boxes, it would have gotten even busier. Do you remember page borders? They were a thing in, I think it was the early 2000s, so almost 20 years ago, but some people are still using these just because like they look cool or you're just used to seeing them. No more page borders, especially if your boss is still using page borders. You can um, you know, forward these slides to them and say, hey, have you considered removing page borders? Um, so check out before, try the squint test, squint to your eyes at your screen, and what do you see? Do you see any patterns in the data? Do you see like lengths of bars or lines going up and down? Or, like, or I don't know, I just see a lot of rectangles, just too many rectangles. So after, now you can actually see data. You can see, oh, there are charts. And like within each chart, here's the distribution I see or here are the patterns I see. Before, super cluttered, no good at all versus after just doing some right clicks to remove borders or just clicking on borders and hitting the delete key on your keyboard. This maybe takes, I don't know, a minute or two to do once you kind of get in the groove of it um, for each graph, like decluttering a pie chart and decluttering a column chart and so on. So you're gonna get faster and faster at finding out where these mouse clicks are in your software program. So you have to do this to every single graph, no matter if you're trying to tell a story or not. Sometimes removing borders is the same as adding white outlines. It's kind of two sides of the same coin. So look at the one on the left, the before version looks really busy because we've got three colors going on. You've got the background color, the white. You've got the 
colored in color, like the purple, and the border color, the black. So you're using three different colors versus on the right, you're only using two colors. You just make the borders the same color as your background. Does that make sense? So like white background, white borders. If you had a black background, you do black borders and so on. You can still tell the states apart, but it's the cleaner version, the more squint test friendly version. Let's this one. We've talked about icons already. I was going to say, yeah, use icons. They're awesome. They're research-based. You know that. Um, and let's try this one. Okay, so this is a real-life graph. It's the cluttered version, and I want you to type in the chat box and give me some ideas for things that you could safely delete from the graph, things you can delete without losing any meaning. This one comes from a health agency that I worked with. So it wasn't percentage of XYZ. It was percentage of people who had a disease uh, month by month last year. But this is exactly what their graph looked like. So they had a slide title that said percentage of this disease by month, comma 2017-18. And then below that they had a graph title, percentage of XYZ by month. And then on the left side, the axis title, percentage of XYZ, and you would have had to like do a head tilt to read that. We're not going to use vertical text anymore. It's not accessible. It takes our brains one and a half times longer to read any. You're not actually tilting your head, but like your, your brain is doing that somersault. Your eyes are doing that somersault to read it. We just want plain old horizontal text. And then look at the bottom of the graph. You've got like slanty, funny, diagonal, like year dash month things, really confusing. And then in the body of the graph, you've got like a green line with little purple dots along the way, lots and lots of clutter for what should be a really simple graph. Okay, do you have any ideas? What can I remove? What can I safely delete from this graph? Do you see any redundancies that could be deleted from here? Casey says delete axis labels. Yep. Yeah, like percentage of XYZ. Is that really necessary because we have the slide title? and the graph title, like, do you need it saying a third time percentage of XYZ? No, that's redundant. It's saying three times something you only need to say once. And the access title on the bottom one that says months, if you labeled those better, like, this is funny, like, computer gibberish, 2017-01, like, just say January 2017. Nobody talks like that. Oh, what month is it? Oh, it's 2019-01. Like, Nobody says that, so your graphs shouldn't be in computer gibberish either. Um, so you don't need the label months right there. Any other ideas? I guess I've given you some of them about the redundancies. If you wanna have little dots along your line to accent those points, do they need to be a different color? No, they can be the same color as the line. You may not even need those points. Do you need all of those grid lines going across the chart or maybe just a handful of them? Do you need all the months labeled? Do you need every single month labeled or maybe just a couple months, maybe like a starting and endpoint month? Let me show you what I came up with. It's the, the crisper, cleaner version that helps you get to the point a lot faster. So rather than having the titles three times, percentage of XYZ, percentage of XYZ, and then like the head tilt thing, percentage of XYZ, it's just once, it's just in the slide title. And I also removed some of the wording. Rather than percentage of XYZ by month, comma, 2017-18, like we know that because the bottom of the graph now shows the time frame. You don't have to include time frames in the title. Totally unnecessary. And I've also cleaned up the axis. So the before axis, see how it says percentage of XYZ, which like that alone is redundant labeling. Um, and you have percentages there. And again, weird computer gibberish, like 0 0.93, 0 0.94. Just add the percentage symbol, you know, just make it easier for people. I removed those funny little purple dots from the line, just made a nice smoothed out green line. And then I labeled a few key points like, you know, 99.5% or 99.6%. Sometimes I'll think of either like a starting point or an ending point to give some nice context, some anchors, um, or maybe a high point or a low point. And then that's what I would talk about in my presentation. You know, I'd be up in front of the room like talking with my clicker and I'd say, hey, this value was 99.5 and then it stayed steady to 99.6 and then it dipped and then it ended at 97.2. I don't usually include decimal places like the 0.5 and the 0.6, but in this case, the numbers were so close to one another, you know, you're just talking about slight, slight differences, so I decided to keep them um, here.
Okay. Yeah, Steve says much easier to read. Exactly. This is not a complicated topic. It was how many people have this disease or no, it wasn't have the disease. These numbers are big. It was, um, this was with the CDC group. It was like the percentage of people who had been screened for this thing. They wanted to have 100% screening at a health center. Um, that's why like you wanted the numbers to be high. That would be horrible if 99.5 of us had this certain disease. Um, but it's related to health. Anyway, super simple topic. Like how many people got screened for this thing? It's not, you don't need a PhD in epidemiology to understand this. Really, really basic concept. So the graph should be really, really basic too. I think um, the one on the left makes the data seem more complicated than it really is. And you're just like stuck with all this unnecessary ink thinking it through like, what am I looking at? I don't know, like, huh, like, what is this? Um, you shouldn't have to think so hard about a graph. You wanna be able to see the data, understand it, act on it, move on, like go use that data to improve things in the world, not spend all your precious mental energy just reading the graph. What a waste of our brains. That's my soapbox speech. Okay, uh, let's try another one. I'll teach you some best practices about color. Color is pretty fun. Um, you already know about dark light contrast. Whose colors are you gonna use? You're gonna use yours. Um, you're gonna brand your visuals with custom colors. I'll usually go to a group's website. You know, I'm a consultant, so I work with dozens of groups every single year. You might just work with your own organization or one or two others, but I'll do some background digging. I just, you know, go to their website, I check out their logo, I see what types of photos they use, what types of fonts do they use. This group to use um, color blocks, like, you know, full color boxes a lot on their website with thick white outlines. And then in the slides that I made for them, I used their same colors, not just Microsoft defaults or Tableau defaults or whatever program you've got, but their colors, so it looks like their data. That's a really easy, easy edit. I also test my color palette in advance to make sure that it's legible for people with color vision deficiencies. About one in 10 people uh, has some form of color vision deficiency, so like a red-green color blindness, there are other types of color blindness too. So it's common enough that you definitely want this to be on your radar, you definitely wanna test for it. This is a slide, um, kind of like a table of contents slide from a group that I was working with. And, you know, it's just like one of the intro slides where we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna talk about project background and then resident quality of life and so on. And I knew in their color palette, I saw this green and red and I thought, okay, time out. Like, I've gotta test these. I've gotta see if this shade of green and red is gonna be legible for the one in 10 people that they're showing this to that is not gonna see green and red apart. Um, there are a lot of free websites where you can do this test. The one I really like is just, um, it's just color-blindness.com, but all you have to do is Google like test for color blindness or test my document for color blindness. And there are a handful of these free sites. You don't have to pay for it. It's like, these are great sites to check accessibility and you just upload your draft project. You know, you just take like a screenshot of it or save it as an image file you upload it and it gives you a preview of what this slide or what your graph would look like for all of your coworkers who are colorblind. And you can see that the green and red and the orange too, they look almost identical. So I had to be really careful with all the graphs I made for them too, um, to make sure like that I wasn't using green and red next to each other. I also test my color palette for grayscale because a lot of people still are printing in grayscale. Again, you know, color printing is expensive. Uh, people are mostly going to be printing things out in gray or in black and white. So I'll usually kind of print one in color, print one in grayscale, compare them side by side, and make sure that when I'm using that dark light contrast that it's enough of a contrast that it still shows up in grayscale. Like making sure I haven't picked a, a light gray that's too light, that's not going to get printed out or photocopied well, and that the, the dark gray and like the color, that there's a, enough of a difference there. So if you have like a yellow in your color palette, that's probably not gonna work. You're probably not gonna use a yellow. I have a yellow in my LLC's color guide, but I use it for, um, you might've seen it for like little arrows or like connecting lines. I don't use text in yellow almost never. So, you know, be careful with kind of your, your lighter colors. You might just kind of have to say like, eh, we're not using that in the graphs. And then of course, once you've got your branded color palette, you've tested it for color vision deficiencies, you've tested it for grayscale, then you just apply that dark light contrast. You can use that in everything. You can do dark light contrast in your bar charts or in your line charts or in your pie charts. Every single graph type 
or in your diagrams like this one. Um, a few years ago when the iPhone 6 came out, it was a really big deal that I had a big screen size. It was like the first phone ever to have that bigger screen. So this simple diagram was just kind of zooming in on the iPhone 6 screen size compared to the others in gray. You can create a dark light contrast in tables too. Just because I have a lot of graphs and pro graph, I'm not anti-table. You're still gonna have lots of tables especially in appendices of reports where you want to show like tons and tons of breakdowns in the end and um, you know provide the details that people want. This study was really interesting. It's from Pew Research Center and they do a lot of opinion polling and social science research. They had polled Europeans and they said, hey Europeans, who do you think is most hardworking and most trustworthy? And you can see that a lot of Europeans said, oh, Germany, Germany is really hardworking and trustworthy, except for the Greeks. They were like, nope, it's us. We are the most hardworking and we are the most trustworthy. Um, so what did they draw attention to in this table? Well, they've grayed everything out. Germany's in gray text. It's not even in black text. They use gray letters. And then Greece is what they drew your attention to with that dark light contrast. They've also used bold text for Greece versus Germany. If you're looking at the right side of the table, you've probably seen uh, the funny story continue. So they also said, hey, Europeans, who's least hardworking and least trustworthy? And uh, a lot of people said Greece. Poor Greece. This is the story that they focused on in, in the article, uh, the accompanying article. So they had like a map of Greece. I think they had photos of Greece or pictures of Greek food or Greek festivals. Like it was a very Greek focused article. They could have also focused on Germany. I think that would have also been an interesting story. You know, in that case, they would have used, made Germany in that darker color and in bold text, and they would have had like a map of Germany and photos of German food and photos of German festivals and things. But they said, you know what, for our audience, we're gonna focus on Greece being the star of the show here. Arc light contrast, you can use it for everything, diagrams, tables. You could also use it in maps. You can use um, kind of like a scary color, like a red or an orange for any type of warning. This map was talking about Craigslist missed connections, which you may or may not know about. So if you know what Craigslist missed connections are, hopefully you find this as humorous um, as I do, that Walmart is a source of Craigslist missed connections. If you don't know about it, oh my goodness, you're missing out. Uh, not right now, but like later today, go check out some Craigslist missed connections. It's where you are shopping in Walmart or you're at the gas station and you see that beautiful guy or girl and then you, you know, maybe you make eye contact and smile for a second and then you go online to Craigslist of all places later to their missed connections kind of um, discussion board and you say, oh, I saw your beautiful smile. I think we're meant to be, etc. So anyway, this, this map was making fun of the fact that Walmart is a source of these uh, encounters these romantic encounters in so much of the South. So they've drawn your eye just to the Walmart Craigslist zones in this dark kind of cautionary red or orange color. Color works like this because it's a pre-attentive attribute. These are the attributes that you don't even have to think about. It's before conscious attention, like you see it instantly and you know. You can see for the orientation that one line is a little tippy. It's oriented differently than the others. You don't have to think about it. Your brain does this processing in a split second before you even realize you're doing it. For shape, you don't have to think that a rectangle is different from the lines. You do it again at the speed of light, so, so fast. You don't have to think about it. So color works like this because of intensity and hue. Intensity being the dark light contrast and hue being a, a different color contrast. So like a, a dark color from your color palette, from your branding guide versus a light gray. It's a great way to save your audience so much time. They don't even have to think about it. Just in a split second, they know that line on the line chart stands out or that bar in the grouping of the bar chart stands out for them. They can still see all the other lines. They can still see all the other bars, but they're seeing it a little bit later. You know, you focus their attention just on one thing at a time. Um, I'll skip this one, or should I do this one? 
Let's do this one. It's a good one. Let's um, put your color knowledge into practice. So there's something fishy going on with this map. It's a simple like CDC map I found on their website. I do a lot of public health work um, in addition to working with a lot of nonprofits and foundations. And it's simply talking about how many staff are based in different states around the country and in some of their different cities. And it caught my attention because you think, oh, great, you know, it's a colorful map, it's the CDC, it's gotta be like a well-designed map, they've got really smart people working there. But then I looked a little bit deeper at this key or legend, and I was like, wait a second, they messed something up. There's an error in the way they've chosen their colors. So let me know in the chat box if you can figure out what the error is, like what is it about these colors that's a little uh, like incorrect, like a little bit off. And what colors would you use instead? And then I'll tell you the answer. There's kind of a, a mismatch here going on. Remember, our brains are drawn to dark colors. We know, we don't even have to think about it, dark means more of something. Like the darker that it is, the more that it is. Now, Myra says, are they trying to draw attention to the locations with lower staffing? Yeah, either lower staffing or, or higher staffing, uh, probably just higher staffing. I, I don't know if this graph had like a huge so what. It was just kind of like CDC presence, not the, not the most compelling title to begin with. But if you think about, okay, our brains are wired so that dark colors stand out. We don't have to think about it. Like dark light contrast is in us as humans. So we want to use that to our advantage. But what they've done in this chart is do you see how the number of CDC staff, it goes from like zero, one to nine, 10 to 19, it goes from low to high, right? Like a small number to a big number. But the colors are mismatched. They've gone from white to, what is that? Like a gray or a light blue, to orange, to blue, to weird like hash marks, which are totally outdated. We used hash marks before we had grayscale printing. So in the 90s, before your printer could color out like a light gray and a medium gray and a dark gray, when we only had black and white, we had to use hash marks to kind of like substitute in for a gray color. Printers do grayscale, unless you have a printer from like 1997, you probably don't. It would be amazing if it lasted that long, but like printers do grayscale, we don't use hash marks anymore. Technology has solved that problem for us. So anyway, what they should have done, because you're talking about a small number of staff to a big number of staff, like a low to high, they should have picked one color and done light to dark. So they could either pick blue, that's the color their logo's in, or orange, another color from their official branding guide, like blue or orange, not both. And they just go white, light blue, medium blue, dark blue, really dark blue, or you know, like white and then light orange, medium orange, dark orange, really, really dark orange, and so on to show the gradation. That would pass the squint test. So when you squint your eyes, Right now, it's kind of like blue and orange when I squint kind of equally stand out. You know, they're both kind of dark colors. But what should stand out is, where's the hash mark? California, your state. You should stand out. You're that like crisscross hash mark design, but it kind of gets lost in there. Does that make sense? It's like the pattern you should see of California being the most. And then what are the other ones? Like Texas and Florida should stand out. Those aren't standing out. Those are getting lost because they've used colors incorrectly. So if you don't use the dark light contrast correctly, which is like, it's so easy to use. Why not use it? Um, you're going to be accidentally like putting kind of the wrong answer out into the world or, or risking that people are misinterpreting your graphs, which is not what we want. You know, we're not trying to like make people not understand the data. Okay, let's talk about text a bit. Text is a lot of fun. Um, so you already know the basics, like you're gonna state your story directly in your title rather than just figure two, you know, make people's lives easier. Just write a simple little takeaway message there. Whose fonts are you gonna use? Yours, the ones from your branding guide. If your branding guide says you're gonna use Calibri size 11 in your reports, great. Calibri is Microsoft's kind of uh, main like font right now or the default font. So don't just use Calibri in all your graphs just because like Microsoft put it there. If your branding guide says we use Arial size 10 or we use like Helvetica or we use whatever font, like use that. So you're going to have to make some intentional edits in your graphs too, just with um, fonts. 
but here are some kind of additional font techniques that I think will help you out a lot. And here's one about establishing a text hierarchy. This is the before version of an annual report. It's from some university staff members that I worked with. These were faculty in the university's library. And they were writing a really easy annual report, just a few pages of bullet points of key milestones. You know what annual reports look like. Like, here's what we accomplished in the past year. Here are our plans for the next year. Super standard annual report stuff. And in their before version, I noticed that it was all pretty much the same font size. So nothing really stood out. You know, it's not a super long report. It's not like they had 100 pages of just like size 11 or size 12 font. It was pretty um, summarized and to the point to begin with, which was great. But they wanted my ideas on how could they take this to the next level. They didn't have any graphs. It wasn't really that type of report. It was more a qualitative report about like, you know, with statements of like here are things that we did. We didn't really have time to add a bunch of graphs from scratch. So we were thinking about how can we just take the existing words and phrases to the next level and make this report more digestible so somebody's you know can see some key points from it so the first thing that we did this is optional but it can add a lot of visual interest we wanted to add a title page like a cover page so we experimented with two 20-minute titles i call these 20-minute titles because these are things that anybody can do in 20 minutes or less you don't have to be a graphic designer to add a title we tried one with a photograph overlay these are librarians so we picked a picture of a book from a free stock photo site we also tried a word cloud kind of overlay like a you know either like photo of books in the background or a word cloud in the background and the word cloud just used the keywords from the report you know nothing like that we had to make up from scratch and we looked at both of these 20 minute titles or excuse me 20 minute uh, like title pages cover pages uh, next to each other and we said you know what we really like the photos I've done other reports where the word cloud like really looks great um, on a cover but we liked the photo of the books here so we added that and already it started to take the report to the next level we were like wow this is looking pretty good you know it almost looks like we didn't make it in word but it is like just plain old word that we we're doing this in and then we took it a step further and we worked on the text hierarchy where we're trying to make the most important information stand out in a larger font. That's another pre-attentive attribute, size. Big things instantly stand out more than small things. So we use that to our advantage. We didn't just use size 11 font. We really bumped everything up. So the heading one is the biggest and then the heading twos and then the body font from there. This might be, um, like in theory, this is easy for people. People are like, oh, I made my heading one size 14 font. You're gonna have to bump it up a lot more than this. I think we use font size maybe 30. I've done heading ones in even size 50 or 60 sometimes. So much, much larger than you're used to doing to create contrast. The point is, like what you're aiming for is that somebody can glance at your report, and they can instantly see where the, the buckets are. You're trying to take this sea of text and you're trying to chunk it into a few manageable chapters to make it more skimmable. In the educational psychology world, we literally call this chunking. And it's the idea that your brain can only keep three to five bits of information, you know, in your mind at once. You can't handle a sea of thousands of words, but you can handle, you know, three to five buckets or three to five pieces. Okay, so we made the font sizes bigger. And then we use a different color for each heading. Again, we're trying to make these chapters or sections stand out. You'd use your colors from your color palette, not mine, et cetera, et cetera. We played around with the page breaks a little bit. We wanted to make sure that each section or each chapter started on a new page. And then we said, okay, this is getting better. We can see the different pieces. Let's make it even more visual. So we um, repeated the photo overlay design for each of our headers. Same exact free stock photo of books that we used on the cover. We just repeated that for the heading ones. There was like, what, what, five, one, two, three, four, five heading ones. Um, just in plain old word, we're just inserting a picture and then I covered it up with a, a rectangle shape so that those white letters would stand out enough and still be legible against the photo. This whole thing, took about an hour for me to do. Again, I do this for a living. You know, I do simple report redesigns all the time. It might take you two hours the first time you're doing it, but the, the goal here too is that it's not supposed to take you all day. I'm trying to teach you really quick wins that are going to make a big difference in your work.
Here's the last um, technique that I'll show you today, and that is text readability. Text readability. So here's another before graph. It's a slide, another public health example. Check out that slide title. It is pretty long. Stage three AIDS classifications and deaths. So persons with diagnosed HIV infection, blah, blah, blah. Like it goes on and on and on. That's pretty lengthy. It's kind of the typical like researcher data analytical thinker type of title where you're like, I'm going to put everything in my title. Or this is probably how this epidemiologist was trained to do it back in her grad school days. She was probably taught like put every single detail ever that you could ever think about, put it right in the graph title, just in case somebody has a question. It's like, that's what the paragraphs are for. That's what footnotes are for. You know, like there's other places we can put that text. Okay, so I want you to think about what a better slide title would be. And then type your idea in the chat box. Um, you might go with a storytelling title for this one. We just went with like a really short title because we knew that she would be physically present talking about these slides. This was for a conference that she was going to, um, a conference with people who knew about public health, but not people who did this exact topic area all day long. You know, so people are like kind of technical when it came to this, but not as expert level as she was about it. So we had to really get to the point quicker. Okay, read this title to yourself. See if you can figure out what is going on. Like what in this title matters? What are the keywords that really matter here? How many times do you have to read it? I'll be quiet so you can read it. Any ideas? I think I had to read this at least five times. And then I said to this woman, her name was Zanita. I was like, Zanita, are we just talking about, well, I, first I said, what is the word classifications? Okay, like I see deaths. I know what a death is. Like, what is classification? And she said, that's a diagnosis. And I was like, why don't we just call it diagnosis, first of all? Like, this is when you find out that you have um, HIV or AIDS, like a how many people were diagnosed, how many people died over time. Like kind of, you know, the good news that it's steadily going down. And I was like, so is this graph just talking about HIV diagnoses and HIV deaths? And she was like, yeah, that's all there is to it. Great, you got it. And I was like, why did I have to spend 10 minutes figuring this out? That's way too long. Like, if that's it, that's it. You know, let's not make it more complex than that. So of course we did some decluttering with the graph. Um, removing a lot of unnecessary ink and removing her logo. Like you don't need the logo taking up too much space or anything. We labeled a couple of key points, the first point, the last point, and then like a peak in the middle. That's what she wanted to talk about with her speaking points. She wanted to say, hey, diagnoses peaked and then went down because of such and such and such. And like deaths went up and then went down because treatment options got better and stuff. Um, so we did like our basic graph decluttering. And then for the title, we just plainly said this graphs about AIDS diagnoses and deaths so we didn't want to make it more complex than that. We took her super researchy technical title and we just bumped it down into a subtitle. So if you're you know kind of learning about data viz for the first time today and saying oh my gosh like this is so different from what I've been doing for the past 10 or 20 or 30 years you don't have to change everything overnight. Sometimes um it's great actually just to take small steps so she wasn't comfortable doing like all the storytelling title right away. So she said, you know, I want to keep my nerdy title, but she was comfortable just kind of bumping it down into a position of a little bit less prominence. You know, it's just gray text now. It's not as large. It's not bold text. It's not like colored text. So this is a great way to kind of um, meet both types of needs, like meet your own worry that somebody's going to ask you a question about like, wait, what is your graph about? Oh, it's about the U.S. and six dependent areas, like uh, different territories or something like um, but still, like, get to the point, AIDS diagnoses and deaths. Now, when we were doing this makeover, I was worried. I said, am I just tired today? Like, did I not have enough coffee? Is that why I couldn't get this graph right away? Or would other people also struggle with this? And there is a way to actually test your text readability. So I recommend doing this. Um, it's definitely worth learning more about text readability and, and reading grade levels. There are all sorts of free tools you can use. These are screenshots from my favorite tool. It's called Readable. 
it's not readable.com. It's readable.io. It's like this cool startup, you know, company and everything. It's a free tool though. Um, I think it's free for like 10 minutes a day. And then you get a little pop-up box that says like, your free 10 minutes is over. Um, do you want to pay $3.99 or something to get the tool? And it's like super, super affordable. Word also has a built-in readability checker. Or if you just Google free grade level checker, you know, free text readability checker, you're going to find lots of other websites like this. But what I love about these tools is they often um, underline things for you too. Like do you see in the before version, the word classifications is underlined. So I thought, oh good. Phew, it wasn't just me not knowing what a classification was. Um, and you like hover your mouse over it and it says, try to find a synonym. Or do you see how the entire before title is like highlighted in that red? You hover your mouse over it and says like, this phrase is too long, try to make it shorter. So it gives you nice little um, tips. And then you can see your average grade level too, like before was a 14.2 and after was a 6.5. It's not that you have to aim for sixth grade reading level. That's about the average actually in the US, like middle school, kind of sixth to eighth grade reading level. I usually aim for high school age. So like 10 or 11 or 12, even if you're talking to a group of people with masters and PhDs, which should be grade level like, I don't know, pretty high up there in like the teens or 20s in terms of grade levels, um, you still wouldn't want to write something at that high of a grade level because then it would feel like homework. You know, it'd be kind of maxing somebody's brain to the most of their reading ability and doing that for like hours and hours a day for them, giving them these long reports is just a little bit too taxing. So I think about what my audience's typical education level is, and then I aim for several notches below that so that they don't hate reading my reports so that they feel like, yeah, this is really easy to read. I know what it says. Now I can take action based on this data. I also really like this readable.io free tool because it tells you how long uh, these phrases take to read. So sometimes I'll put entire uh, like blog posts in here or I'll put entire reports in here and it'll tell me like your report's going to take 18 hours to read. And I'm like, okay, this it's not realistic to expect my audience to read for 18 hours. So I'll think about like how can I cut out the non-essential pages of my report or just or um, literally cut, like cut and paste. I'll take the non-essential information from the body of the report and put it in the back in the appendix too, um, and just keep like the core information in the, the center of the report. I was going to show you some before and after makeovers, um, kind of from start to finish, but um, as usual, I was thinking like, oh great, 90 minutes, that's so much time. It's not, 90 minutes flies by. So let me, um, I'll just jump to the end now and show you kind of some resources that you can maybe use uh, to learn more. So I hope you keep learning after today. I hope this was a nice start to your Friday to get you, you know, energized and enthused about data. If you want to learn more, I publish a ton of blog posts. I've been blogging for, I think, like six or seven years now. So I've got hundreds of articles on there. Um, so you can check it out at depictdatastudio.com. I also have some online courses you might like. Soar Beyond the Dusty Shelf Report. You know, like the 100-page Dusty Shelf Reports. Those are the ones that keep me up at night that really, really bother me that I'm trying to really combat with all of my work and, and you know, pass on better communication skills to people like you. This is my free mini course that you might like. So you just can enroll and then there are seven short videos. They're each about five minutes long. You know, the idea is like watch a video while you eat lunch and, and learn practical tips as you go. So if you want to enroll in this one, go for it. Um, it's free. Pass it on to your coworkers. Um, and of course, you can reach out to me anytime through my website. My email information is on there. I have a contact form on there if you want to follow up. I'm on social media too. On Twitter, I'm at Ann K. Emery. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned a lot. If you've got any questions, let me know now in the chat box. Um, or again, feel free to follow up with me at some point down the road. Thanks so much. Back to you, Chris.